Hi, welcome back to World History by Jew. I'm your lecturer, Seth Fleischman. I've got a very special lecture for you tonight. Over the last few months, we've been talking about the Bronze Age collapse, and I've been working towards this lecture for weeks now. This is the lecture where I'm gonna bring all of our Bronze Age collapse material together, and actually some of our Egy Egyptian material as well, into one final lecture. So this is our Bronze Age collapse grand finale, I'd say after this lecture, we're basically done with the Bronze Age collapse, maybe for good. All right, so join me tonight as we talk about the Samson secret, the Tribe of Don's secret origin. This slide will look very familiar to those of you who have seen my earliest lectures when I was dating the Exodus from Egypt, but I need to bring it back tonight as it's one of the many pieces that we'll be uh, putting together into one coherent story. So what I did in my earlier lectures on this channel is I dated the Exodus and I was able to narrow it down to a probable range. And here's here are the thoughts. We knew that the, that the Israelites helped build a town called Pi Ramses, as the Torah tells us. Pi Ramses is known from archaeological investigation and existed from about 1280 to 1060 BCE. So if the Jews helped build it, then it would have had to have been closer to that 1280 date that the Jews were there, right? Then we have Ramses the Great, and if you want to go back to, to my, the Exodus really happened, I talk a lot about Ramses the Great, but something significant happened to him in his 20th to 25th years, and that gave us the date of 1259 to 1254. So we started really putting these three ideas together as to when the Exodus could happen. But we have to remember, too, that we know the Israelites wandered in the desert for approximately 40 years. It doesn't need to be 40 years on the spot, but they're about three, four, five decades, somewhere, somewhere in there, the Jews or the Israelites are wandering in the desert. And then we have the great Merneptah Stela, uh, when we find out that the people of Israel were in Canaan sometime shortly before 1208 BCE. And I have an entire lecture about that. So that's Z07 here. The last point I want to make, which I've added for you tonight, is the archaeology shows Israelites in Canaan after 1208 BCE. And this sentence really gets added because of my Bronze Age collapse in the Bible lecture, which is Z10. But point being, we know that Israelite settlements did not start until around 12, this 1208 BC. So in other words, in Renepistela, the Israelite uh, settlements did not start till after that point in time, which is very important. So all of this put together gives us a range of the Exodus somewhere around 1270 to 1235 BC is a longer range. And then if you want to narrow it down, it's, prob it's probable that you could say it was sometime in 1260 to 1245 BCE. I don't want anyone getting upset if it's 20 years before or 20 years after, but I just want to give you an idea of what to work with here, what direction we've been thinking on our channel as we've done these investigations together. And now I want to add another set of dates to it. So we're gonna leave our Exodus dates here. So here's the Exodus dates I just discussed. And now I wanna throw in the Bronze Age collapse dating. And I use the dating scheme that uh, Dr. Eric Klein shared in his famous book, 1177 BCE. Now, he tells us about the about civilization declining starting around 1250 BCE and speeding up shortly after 1225 BCE. By the way, all of his dates have ranges and are estimates, but they're 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 solid. It's close. So we now see around uh, that we have this first wave of the Sea Peoples defeat in Egypt in 1207 BC. By the way, this is our friend Merneptah. So Merneptah's come back to into this slide. He's kind of the guy connecting our two slides here. And then it was about 15 or 20 years later that we'd really start seeing one ancient site after another falling. So we have multiple sites in Greece around 1190 BCE, the fall of Troy in 1190 BCE, then Cyprus, that same year, very close to it, U Ugar, which is one of my favorite places to talk about also. So all of that in that 1190 to BCE, and if you look at Anatolia from 1190 to 1180 BCE, we have a lot of cities succumbing to what's been proposed as the Sea Peoples and one of those great empires that fell were the Hittites. Now we're gonna move forward a couple more years and Egypt is gonna face down this Sea People threat. So the Sea Peoples, and I'll show a map later, have taken over this whole area and then in 1177, this whole Eastern Mediterranean, and then in 1177 BCE, is when Egypt faces down against the Sea Peoples. And Egypt survives 
wounded but survives and we see these sea people now starting to settle circa 1177 BC they're going to start settling in the land of Canaan so if the sea people are coming in around 1177 BCE give or take 10 or 20 years and we're saying the Israelites were in Canaan sometime shortly after 1210 BCE then they're all moving into the area around the same decades. And this means that they're interacting. And this is a very important point for us that we're bringing together the archeology span with the biblical tradition. Now, before we get going here, I have one more administrative slide to show you. And this slide is a complete list of all my videos I have cited in this lecture. And all of these can be found on my YouTube channel. I use these little Z numbers to identify the lectures when they're part of a series, okay? so you will be able to get all the information to tell the story through this one lecture. But if you see something, if you're interested in something, you want to know more about that topic, then you will see, look, these little green boxes pop up. I'll have green boxes like this on all the slides that reference another lecture. So if you want to know, uh, I'm going to move fast over some of these slides. If you want to know more about any of those topics, you have your answers right there. The slide itself will identify where to go for more. For those of you who have been watching all these videos, I hope it's special for you that I was able to bring it all together because uh, I, I did this really for uh, your enjoyment, but you can see how everything is linked. Now, the one core group of videos I should mention are the ones that start out with Z15. So Z15, A, B, C, D, U, C through G. These are the background information for the tribe of Don specifically, but really we touch on all the ones listed at some point tonight. Okay, that's enough of an intro. Let's jump right into the material. Now, to get us started tonight, we're actually not going to antiquity. We're going to talk about an Israeli who lived just a few decades ago. Yigal Yadin was a very special individual, like the soldier turned scholar who had become one of the great Israeli archaeologists, but got his start uh, during the War of Independence as a military hero. He was born in 1917 in Jerusalem, the son of an archaeologist. And he, in 1936, still quite young, he left school for the military, which was the unfortunate position for many Israelis at that point in time. In the 1940s, he kind of went back and forth between being both a soldier and a student, but in 1947 would be activated in the military knowing war was coming. In 1948, he served in the Israeli War of Independence. In 1949, he would become Israel's second chief of staff at a, the tender age of 32. And as he did everything at, the, at a tender young age, he would retire from the military at 35 to devote his entire life to archaeology and scholarship, although uh, towards the end he'd come back into public service. I'll talk about that in just one minute. So let's talk about Yadin as an archaeologist. So in 1955 he got his PhD and he, he really became the archaeologist of the people. Uh, let me explain. He wrote books on his works that were meant not just for scholars but for the public as well. And I put a, two of his most famous books here and as uh, images, they probably are familiar to many of you. And, and this, these two books, at least in my mind, I have them as well. And they, they represent uh, Yadin in my head as this archaeologist who brought uh, scholarship to the people in simple terms and, and in ways that the every man can appreciate. Now, he also, uh, so he wrote numerous books. He, he led ex uh, excavations at Hazor, and then the Humram Cave, that's the Dead Sea Scrolls, Masada, uh, Megiddo, and he would close his career going back to Tel Hazor. Uh, I actually, I have that, that book as well. There was a better one that just came out a couple years ago. Anyway, I'm digressing. Uh, he also worked very hard to uh, stop the, to stop artifacts from being stolen, and really his biggest adversary, and probably in quite in both in terms of archaeology and in the military was another well-remembered general. I won't mention any names, but I will mention a, a famous quote uh, when, when Yadin was trying to fight the Israeli military from stealing artifacts. He once remarked, uh, I know who stole it. I'm not going to say who it is, but if I catch him, I'll poke out his other eye too. You know, I, always, I always like that quote, so I, I had to share. But anyway, 
Yadin, as I said, would go back into public service and would be a politician. He served as a senior advisor to the military during both the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War, and eventually would enter the Knesset. So in, from 1977 to 1981, he served in the Knesset, which is the Israeli parliament. Uh, he was deputy prime minister under Menachem Begin, and he was part of the peace talks with Egypt in 1977. There's a great story about him with Sadat, uh, Egypt's leader, that he, all, he and Sadat shared a pipe. You know, this, uh, this is more in our, as an American, our Native American line of thinking of the peace pipe, but it's very symbolic that Yadin shared his uh, pipe tobacco with, with Sadat. Now, Yadin would return back to academia at the very end of his life, and he passed away uh, in 1984 at still relatively young age in our modern terms. Now, Yadin has left us with a legacy we're going to explore tonight. Really, his greatest archaeological legacy, the one that everyone knows, is the story he has pieced together about the Masada. Uh, in fact, if you look here at the book, the momentous archaeological discovery revealing the heroic life and struggle of the Jewish zealots at Masada. Okay, so this is what he's best known for, but he has another theory that's been floating around for about 50 years. And what I want to do is use this particular theory regarding the tribe of Don to actually wrap up our series on the Brain Jays Collapse. So we're gonna look at the theory that Yadin proposed 50 years ago, pull in all the latest research we have and put it all together into one coherent presentation. So Yadin's theory, his question was, or I should say his idea was that the Israelite, Israelite tribe of Don were sea people. Now, what would make a great biblical archaeologist like Yadin think one of the Israelite tribes came from Greece? Well, that's our here tonight. That's going to be our archaeological investigation and adventure for the next hour or so. Okay, let's take a look at Genesis chapter 49. This is Jacob's deathbed blessings to his sons, and his sons, of course, become the tribes of Israel. And each son is given uh, a specific way of describing them, and it's poetic, and it's not always exactly clear what it is, but to look at a few of them, you know, Reuben, you're my firstborn, and Yehuda, your brother shall praise you, and then you look down to, to Zebulun, who shall dwell by the seashore, he shall be a haven for his ships, we're going to come back to this, this one in a minute, but, and then we have Asher, and Asher's bread shall be rich, so you see each one of them has a, has some sort of description that makes them stand out. Now what I want to do is look at the tribe of Don. We learn here that, that Don shall govern his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Don shall be a servant by the road, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider is thrown backwards. So what the sentence I want you to note is Don shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel, as. Now, that's very interesting that he needs to judge his people like he's one of the tribes of Israel because we all thought he was one of the tribes of Israel, right? Why does he need to act like he's one of the tribes? So this is already sets the tribe of Don apart. He's a little bit different than the rest of the tribes, and that's what we're going to explore first tonight. It's not just chapter, it's not just Genesis chapter 49. There are others, the other oddities when you look at the tribe of Don. So first of all, let me just say this is a summary of what I do in this biblical oddity Z15F. So if you want to know more about the information on the slide, I've got a whole lecture on it, but this is going to be a shorter version of that. So in Genesis chapter 46, Don has only one descendant listed. Now, if you look at Genesis chapter 46, you see everyone has multiple descendants, plenty of kids, uh, but Don stands out because he only has one son listed, and even the other minor tribes have at least two, and even even more unusual is that the Hebrew seems almost like there's a grammatical error there. In Hebrew, we have the plural for sons for Don, but yet only one son is listed, that, and that's Hushim. Now, if you look at Numbers chapter 26, we have a similar idea. Again, Don only has one descendant listed. Everyone else has at least two sons, but in this case, we have grandchildren included too. So most of the, the Jacob sons even have grandchildren listed. And then we look at Don. What does Don have? Don has one son listed. Even stranger than that, this one son's name is written differently than it was in Genesis chapter 46. In other words, Kushim has become Shucham. Uh, so poor guy, right? He only has one son listed, and the name's not even the same in, in these two chapters. But then your question is, well, did Don have descendants? Well, we know Don had descendants. 
most famously is Samson. And we're going to talk about Samson a little bit later in this, this lecture, but I listed a few of them here that I, I just quickly searched out just to show you that we know Don had, had descendants. Uh, there's no question, but he only has one listed when all others have multiple. Let's look at another chapter. This is from Chronicles. Now, Chronicles gives us this great list of genealogy. So first of all, it starts off in chapter two, and it's telling us that these are the sons of, of Israel, of Jacob, and everything's normal, that's fine. But then as we move into chapter four, we get into detailed listings of each of his sons. And that's great, right? So we know who descended from Reuben, we know who descended from Levi, and who descended from Benjamin, but there's uh, a problem, and that is that Don is omitted. That's right, we went through the detail of all these sons, but Don is omitted. Why is Don omitted? I should also mention that, that Zebulon is also uh, omitted, but notice that Don's not here. Where's Don? Who, what happened to Don? Let me show you something else. Jews famously are supposed to marry other Jews, right? It's, common knowledge. Here we have in the Bible, these lines are recording a tribe that repeatedly marries outside of Judaism, who intermarries with other peoples. So if you look at Judges 14 too, that's actually Samson saying, I want a Philistine wife. And then we have the blasphemer in Leviticus 24, also of a mixed marriage and from the tribe of Don on his Jewish side. And then we see about in Chronicles, the son of a woman from Don, uh, but the father was a man from Tyre, from, from Lebanon. So tribe of Don has this odd pattern of, of mixed marriages, and it just seems to be more accepted for the tribe of Don. Such oddities. Don is missing in Chronicles chapters 4 to 8, but so is Zebulon. And I said I was going to come back to this. What do Don and Zebulon have in common? That's what I want you to think about. What do Don and Zebulon have in common? And I want you to look at these two lines. Zebulon shall dwell by the seashore. He shall be a haven for ships. And then we have this quote from Deborah from Judges. And Don, why did he linger by his ships? Now, why is it? What's the big deal, Seth? We're talking about ships. Okay, well, in the Exodus, the Jews walked out of Egypt. Why are these tribes associated with ships? So odd, and it's just the two of them. Okay, so think about that and let's let's move on. I've got a couple other things for you to think about, including that we need to know more about this quote from Deborah, from Devorah. Now, our, our first verse here is talking about the tribe of Don fighting the Amorites. And this is interesting just to make a mental note when you look at the map later that I'll be talking about the tribe of Don fighting the Philistines, but they didn't just have the Philistines as enemies in their original land. They also had the Amorites, so they were under a lot of pressure. Uh, that's my point. But the real reason I want to look at this slide is on the previous slide when I talked about a quote from Deborah, I want to look at the Song of Deborah. Now, the Song of De De Deborah is a victory hymn sung by the Jewish judge Deborah, or Devorah, and it's a, a hymn of thanks after the Israelites have defeated the king of Hazor and his general Sisera. I've got a whole lecture about that here on Z13 if, if you're interested. But for tonight's purposes, let's just look at how this affects the tribe of Don. So we know from the Song of Deborah that six tribes teamed up to defeat the, defeat the people from Chazor and their coalition. But four tribes did not help. And those four tribes that did not help were Reuben, God, Don, and Asher. Now, there is this great line about the tribe of Don, which I just showed you on the previous slide, and we're going to talk about it in a minute now. Judges 5.17, and Don, why did he linger by the ships? Now, and Asher remained at the seacoast and tarried at his landings, but Don, why did he linger by his ships? So this is this linger in ships are two very interesting words. As I said a minute ago, why are people who walked out of Egypt have ships all of a sudden? That's interesting point number one. The other is this word, Yagor. Now, Yagor has been translated as linger, but it, it's an odd word. It doesn't appear anywhere else in the Torah, and it seems to be 
connected to gare, which is stranger or foreigner. So in short, this quote is saying in Don, like the other. So in short, what this is saying is Don is like this other, like this stranger, like this foreigner, and he's hiding in his ships when he should be helping out his teammates, if I can call the tribe's teammates. So, hmm, that's odd. He's this other hiding in his ships, yet we have instructions that everyone's supposed to treat Don like one of the tribes. Okay, now let's take a look at a few more verses. If you look at this map, this map is a composite of the book of Joshua. And this, so the map takes the, the geographic, and by the way, this first quote is a, this is a good one for seeing how you have these geographic spaces. The seventh lot fell to the tribe of the Danites. So all the tribes have these geographic places, and uh, um, this map is showing those, those places. Now let's, let's look at Don specifically. So the seventh lot fell to the tribe of the Danites and we have these cities pointed out and this is this maps it out for you. Joppa or ja is really Jaffa, okay? So modern terms uh, and uh, Jaffa is connected to modern Tel Aviv. So you have like, if you've ever been there, if you wanna look on a map, you'll see that old town Jaffa basically touches modern Tel Aviv. So this is the big port area for the tribe of Don. It's a little bit odd because we know some of this was Philistine territory, like Ekron, as you can see, is clearly within the, and it's listed here as well, if you want to see in the text. Ekron is clearly listed as part of the tribe of Don's territory, but we know it was, it was actually a Philistine town. It was part of Philistia. So there's there's some overlap here that's that's hard to, to explain. And, and uh, mentioned a, a couple other places. The Zora and Neshtal are going to be important for, for Samson, as will Timna. Ir Shemesh is really Beit Shemesh, which is known for many of you watching this, uh, I'm sure, and, and as is B'nai Brock. Okay, all right, now ne next verse. The next two verses in Joshua then tell us this very odd story, but the territory of the Danites slipped from their grasp, so the Danites migrated and made war on Leshem. This is Laish. They captured it and put it to the sword. They took possession of it and they changed the name of Laish to Don after their ancestor Don. Okay, so this is odd. Okay, the Danites last lost their land to their enemies and they migrated way north, way up here. See, there's Don on the map. Okay. And then they conquered a town called Laish and renamed it Don. Hence it is on the map. So let's take a look at another map that shows this migration clearly. And here you go. So here's Jaffa, uh, the original location and their little journey up north here. Now I have one more verse I wanna show you on this slide before I move on. Now we're gonna skip from Joshua to Judges. So in Judges chapter 18, in those days there was no king in Israel. Okay, this tells us it's during the period of Judges. And in those days, the tribe of Don was seeking a territory in which to settle for to that day, no territory had fallen to their lot among the tribes of Israel. Okay, this is odd. Why is this odd? Because Joshua came before Judges. Now, Joshua told us that there was a lot, that there was an inheritance for the tribe of Don. Okay, clear. And then you read Judges, which came after, and it says there was no inheritance for the tribe of Don. They had no territory, which seems to contradict Joshua. So we start asking ourselves, okay, okay, why didn't Don get an inheritance like the rest of the tribe? So something to do with them being treated like a tribe, uh, as a tribe? Is it something to do with them being on ships? Okay, next thought. Now I'm going to talk about camping. Let's go camping. I've named this slide the, the Camp of Don. You'll see why in a minute. In Numbers 2, chapter 2, verse 25, we're, we, this this cha number chapter 2 is talking about how the tribes were camped uh, and they're really military formation on, on their way after the departure from, from Egypt, okay? And, and in Numbers chapter two, they're all mentioned as being in camps, but that's kind of the end of the camps uh, after, after Numbers. But what's different about the tribe of Don is they seem to stay in a camp. The, there's a record here in, in Judges, both chapter 13 and in chapter 18 of, the, of Don still being in camp. So Judges 13 here is, here is talking about from the story of Samson, the encampment of Don, right? So they're an encampment still during Samson's day, and it's between Zora and Eshtol. And then we move on into Judges 18, and this is from that migration. When they make that move to the north, we're told that a place is actually even named 
the camp of Don after these this tribe that was in a camp. So Don is identified with being a semi-nomadic, being in a semi-nomadic camp, right? They're, they're, they seem to be semi-nomadic much longer than the other tribes, or at least they're somewhat on the move. And I mean that is in mass, they're on, they're on the move. Now I'm gonna actually talk a little bit more about Judges chapter 18 in just a minute, because it's very important for us. But first I wanna take a little detour and talk about Rashi. Now, who is Rashi? To many of you watching this, I don't even need to bring it up. Everyone knows Rashi, but to others, you've never heard the name before. So Rashi, by most people's counts, is the greatest biblical commentator ever. By the way, he also did the has authoritative commentary on the Talmud that's been printed ever since the Talmud started being printed. But there's been a lot of great rabbis throughout Jewish history. And when it comes to biblical commentary, you can make the argument he was the best ever, the most influential ever. Uh, and that's saying a whole lot. Now he was, he lived in what's now France and, and lived from 1040 to 1105. His name was actually Rabbi Shlomo Yataki, but we just, we just say Rashi for short. We, uh, famous rabbis regularly, we use an acronym to, to refer to them in the future. Now, what I want to look at is Rashi's commentary on chapter, on Numbers chapter 10, verse 25. And you can pause the screen and, and read it. There's a couple important points I, I want to make about this. One is that Don was the last tribe to march, as I just said. Uh, you would start thinking, is there some symbolism to this? Does this mean that they were the last ones in, uh, into the land of Israel? Is that why they're considered to be the last ones marching? They were also the gatherer, considered the gatherer of all the camps. So in other words, they were all dealing with all the stragglers. They were the, by the way, if you remember from my uh, lecture on the Amalekites, which was Z14, I talked about the Amalekites attacking the, the rear of the Israelite camps. So certainly the first one that would have been to facing them would have been the tribe of Don, right? They're, they were marching in, in the back. But so the tribe of Don grabbed, the, grabbed this mixed multitude, the ones that wanted to come along. So is this telling us that if they're now partially populated by this mixed multitude, maybe they have some people that were not Israelite to begin with? And then we see that the tribe of Don was marching in military formation. In other words, it seems to be indicating that they have, they and Judah, really, those were the two, seem to have some sort of military experience, which stands out a little bit about when you talk about slaves leaving Egypt. So in short, according to rabbinic tradition, in fact, arguably the greatest rabbinic tradition, Don came last of all the tribes. They were composed of a mixed multitude, including many experienced troops. Okay, so that's that's how Rashi can help us a little bit. Now I want to move on and get back to this Judges chapter 18. If you look here on the left, this is, I left out a, a few lines that were repetitive or weren't vital to the story, but if you want to pause the screen and read this, this will give you really the full story of the Danite migration from around Jaffa up here to Don. And I do talk about it at length and go through the entire story in Z15F, which I, I'm not gonna do uh, right now, just, just due to time. But I'm gonna assume you know it, so you've either paused it and read it now, or you've watched my last lecture. And I want to mention several important points. First of all, when we read about this migration in, in, in Judges chapter 18, it fits what we know geographically, that it's saying that basically the tribe of Don marched from this area through the hill country and up to this area of Israel. Okay, so it fits. I'm gonna talk about the archeology span of those two sites. Uh, just give me a few minutes, but we're gonna to get to the archeology. span I want to just give you a little bit more information to work with before we move on though. So now, and this also helps us in terms of dating because when you read Judges chapter 18, it tells us that the Sidonians who lived here actually were the protectors of Laish, the former, what became Teldon. They, they protected this area. The Tanakh tells us that the Sidonians were unable to come to the aid of the residents of Laish when the Danites invaded and took over their town. This is important for dating because it gives us a very important date about Tiglath-Pileser. And Tiglath-Pileser uh, was an Assyrian king who conquered the Sidonians around about 1100 BCE. So knowing our previous dates that I started with tonight and knowing it's in the 1100s when 
all this is happening. Let's say that Anites came into Joppa, they lived in this area and they're camped for 50 years or so, and then migrated north, it would be in the 1100s or so when Tiglath-Pileser comes in and conquers the Sidonians who then cannot help the citizens of Laish when the Danites invade. It's also important to note that we have the story of Winamun, which I mentioned in a couple other lectures, including the Z15F, that we that when he lists, he's a, a pre Egyptian priest who lists the various peoples along the coast, and he does not talk about any Danites or anyone related to Danites or anything close to Danites being in Jaffa at that time, which would make sense if in the late 1100s BCE, the Danites were already here, they would not be down here when Winamun came through around about 1080 BCE. Also, when we talk about their, the, the lifestyle of the, if in, what we learn in Judges 18 is that it's very specific that the Danites moved with all the possessions, with their wives, children, that put their ox carts first and headed north. It tells us in Judges 18 that, as I mentioned a couple uh, slides ago, that the Danites lived in a camp. They also had experienced spies and troops, which backs up what we know that they're experienced military, uh, as we saw in Numbers chapter 10. Finally, the last point on Judges 18 is that we have these odd religious practices, right? So what do I mean by that? Well, they had to hire a priest. That's right. On their way north, they, the Danites stopped to hire a priest to come and serve as their guide for Judaism. Uh, so this is very odd. If this is an Israelite tribe, why do they need to hire a priest? They didn't know anything about the Israelite religion. They didn't already have a priest. Uh, oh, and just to make things even more interesting, uh, idols were a part of their worship. So odd, it's just these, it's all just very odd, right? It's not what you think of in terms uh, of Judaism. It gives you something to contemplate. So let's put all this together so far. What have we learned? We have the strange case of the tribe of Don. So on his deathbed, Jacob implored his sons to treat Don as a tribe. Okay, next. Don's descendants, Remember I talked about his sons and lack of grandsons. His descendants are shortchanged, names misspelled, or they're just plain missing. Don intermarried with other nations. It certainly has a propensity for it beyond the other, the other tribes. I'm not saying it hasn't been recorded somewhere else for another tribe, but definitely Don seems to do it more than the others. Don, as we saw with in the Song of Deborah, failed to come to the aids of the other tribes. And by the way, when Don's facing these Amorites, these Philistines, uh, we have no record uh, of the other tribes coming to their aid either. So the door seems to swing both ways, or maybe it doesn't swing at all would be the better. It doesn't swing either way, maybe I should say that. We see Don has no inheritance, right? He, uh, he, he, well, maybe he did have an heir somewhere in Joshua, but then we read Judges, he didn't have an inheritance. So confusing. No one else is like that. All the other tribes have a clear inheritance. Don traveled last physically and perhaps symbolically behind the other tribes. Don was unfamiliar with Israelite religion, which I just mentioned. Don has experienced military, which I said this slide and the one before. Don was semi-nomadic and lived in camps. I know I've really driven home this camps thing at this point, but, and then finally, maybe the point I've driven home the most is Don is associated with ships. Okay, so let's put all this together. Uh, our first pot for the night, we're gonna mix up our pot and then we're gonna ask the question, or at least I should ask Yadin's question, was the tribe of Don an Israelite tribe or a sea people? Now you start thinking, maybe Yadin had a point. Now you start thinking, what could make this great biblical archeologist actually think a Israelite tribe were really Greek? Okay, give me some time, no one get offended. Let's take a closer look at this. We're gonna switch gears and talk about the Bronze Age collapse. I've done enough introductions to the Bronze Age collapse. Many of you have heard me do some version of an intro multiple times, so I decided I'm going to skip it tonight. I talked about it briefly at the very beginning of this lecture, and we're going to get to the sea people now. If the Bronze Age Collapse is not familiar to you, I highly recommend you watch at least one, or if not both, of these two lectures, Z8 and Z9, uh, before continuing on this lecture. Just the real basics are we had this, this high point of civilization in the 1200s BCE, all these power, all these 
powers in the Eastern Mediterranean who were interconnected, and then it all came crashing down. And the most relevant to our discussion has been the impact on the Sea Peoples, these peoples that, and this map here on the left shows you that they were these peoples that uh, seemed to invade and destroy along the way as they covered the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, in our lectures during the Bronze Age collapse, we've we've talked about these five sea peoples. Now, no, see, there's nine. Uh, there's nine sea peoples, but we're focusing on these five. And the ones in bold, not only we talked about, they're going to be on our, our map of the land of Canaan, uh, which we're going to discuss again. It should be familiar to most of you, but it's, it's an important map for our discussion we're going to come back to. So my point is, make sure you have these five in, he in, in your head, because those are the ones that I want you to remember. Now, these these people are considered to have come from the Greek world, but by Greek world, I mean uh, not just Greece, I mean the Aegean, I mean Crete, Cyprus, and Anatolia as well. In antiquity, a large portion of Anatolia had Greeks, or people that we now would identify as those of, of the Greek culture. These are important points to consider as you look at this map and see this movement and, and note all the damages here as the sea people came in and destroyed town after town after town on their way to Egypt. Now, speaking of Egypt, let's take a closer look. These are inscriptions by Ramses III and he was the Pharaoh who faced the great uh, sea people invasion of 1177 BCE and his writings and also his reliefs are the most vital information we have for reconstructing the Bronze Age collapse, the invasion of the Sea Peoples, who the Sea Peoples were. We have Ramses III to thank for much of our knowledge today. Now there's a couple inscriptions I'd like you to, I'd like to take note of. One is Ramses III, his Papyrus Harris, which is a long document like I, a, detailing his his reign, the chronicles of his reign. And then we have Medinet Habu, uh, which is his mortuary temple, and he has inscriptions and reliefs there as well. And we're going to, I've talked about it in depth in Z09, uh, which was Egypt versus the Sea Peoples. Uh, and then we came back and looked at it again when we talked about the Denian Sea People in Z15A. So I'm not going to spend as much time on it as I'd like to spend because, well, I've already spent a lot of time on it. So check out those other lectures if you're not familiar. Now, Ramses III gave us these, these two inscriptions, these two records that I want to review again tonight. And that is, I on the top one here, I overthrew the Sea Peoples from their lands. I slew the Danuna the Denyan who are in their isles, and the Jekyll and the Peleset, who are the Philistines, were made ashes. And then, let's look down at this, this next one. Their confederation, so the confederation of the Sea Peoples were the Philistines, the Jekyll, the Shekelesh, the Denyan, and the Weshesh lands united. Now, I want you to note these three. We're going to come back to it. The Danuna, or the Denyan, who were in their isles, the Jekyll and the Peleset, who are the Philistines. Those three are, are coming together and we're going to come back to it. But I just want to give you a taste of the reliefs. I meant it in Habu in case you haven't seen it. And this is a this is Ramses III's record of the his battle against the land forces of the sea people. I know the sea people, but they actually invaded by land and by sea, which again I talk about uh, in the Z09. And I explain the, the this relief in detail. But I wanted you to note a, a just a couple interesting things, and that is by zooming in. So notice these squares are just zoomed in versions of what you are to see on the relief, and note that you have these ox carts pulling wives and children. See, wife of sea people, wife of sea people, children of sea people. Again, children of sea people, wife of sea people, ox cart pulling their possessions. This sounds a lot like our description of the Danites, right? When the Danites migrated, they said they put their ox carts before and they, their wives and children and all that and the whole camp moved. And so we have this visual image from the Egyptians talking about the Sea Peoples, but it also gives us a visual of what the biblical story of the of Judges 18 was telling us also about a migration, just to get an idea of what this, these, these migrations would have looked like. And of course they are the Sea People. So I also discussed the sea battle as well in Z09, if you want to check that out. But of course, the sea people were in their ships, right? So remember, in their ships is a big theme for us in this, this lecture tonight. So ships and camps, ships and camps. Sounds very familiar, right? I can't think, where did we talk about ships and camps? 
Okay, let's take a look at our map of Canaan. This is the one that I referenced a couple slides ago when I listed the sea people and I said, hey, remember these five sea people? These are what we talked about and we're going to get to the map. So this is the map. I didn't think I really needed to jump around at that time. You don't need to go back. It, what I'm going to tell you um, is going to be said here. So we, in, in our several lectures, and by the way, you can see the lecture numbers right here. We talked about these different sea people and now I have a map of the coast of Canaan uh, and where they settle on the coast of Canaan. So first we have the Chardana right up here, the purple, and then we had the Jekyll and green. Down here is Philistia. And then we spoke about the Malachites and my theory of how the Malachites got there. And that one, if, if you haven't seen one, please check it out. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite lectures that, that I've done. But if we have identified all these different sea people and that these are their locations, which at least for these top three the, are well attested. Uh, I'm not saying 100% of it. Well, 100% of the people would agree that Philistines were here in Philistia. I, I think the majority would be okay with the Chardana and Jekyll here as well. Well, we have this gap in the middle, right? This big gap. And you, you can see what I'm indicating here about this gap is that's where the tribe of Don was. Now that fits perfectly well with our overall story because if the tribe of Don, it, was here, we know there's a gap right here that there are no other sea people at this location. And we know from Joshua that, that this was originally their land, uh, their inherited land, although Judges tells us it wasn't their inherited land, but Judges still tells us they came from this area and headed north. So it all makes a lot of sense. There's the gap. This is where we're told what they were. So it all kind of comes together. But it's kind of this oddball, right, that you have all these sea people listed and then all of a sudden you have this, this is Israelite tribe. Now, that kind of gets Yadin back to, to his thinking. So instead of being the lone Israelite tribe on the coast, what if the tribe of Don was actually one of these sea peoples, right? But which of these sea peoples? And that's the next step in our conversation tonight. Which of these sea peoples? Okay, if they were the sea peoples, do we know who they were? This chart was analyzed in each of our individual sea peoples lectures. So now what I want to do is I want to focus on the Dinian people, which is you have this blue rectangle around the Dinian, but is but they're they're connected to these three. So if you remember from the inscriptions of Ramses III, I told you to remember the three that were together in his inscriptions, and these are those three: the Dinian, the Jekyll, and the Peliset. Now, let's take a look at what they have in common physically. We know their names were written together, but they had a physical characteristic that they shared, and that is the way that they dressed. If you notice these feather headdresses, the Egyptians have kindly labeled it for us that while normally you see this, you think Philistines. In fact, even when I first introduced this relief, I said, when you see this thing, Philistines for our purposes now, well, that was for now, uh, that back then. Now I'm going to break it down for you uh, to say that this feathered hairdress actually was identifying three different sea people that we know from the reliefs. This would be the Dinian, the Jekyll, and the Peliset. So while, so not only do they seem to move together by the inscriptions, they also seem to dress alike too, which would set, which would indicate that they had similar origins, right? So our important point is the Egyptians reliefs portray the Dinian to be dressed the same as the Philistines and the Jekyll. This indicates that the Egyptians viewed the Dinian as being from the Aegean world, the Greek world. So now what I want to ask is, looking at our map again, what if the Danites were actually the Dinian? Hmm. So maybe we should try to figure out a little bit more about the Dinian. Who are the Dinian according to the Egyptians? Now the Dinian have some history in Egypt. They have been connected to the Tenya or the Tenaya people. So if you think Dinya and Tenya, it's very close phonetically uh, and that it's very common in languages for the D and T to get interchanged. So the, the well, not everyone thinks this, the general idea is that the, the Dinian first show up a couple hundred years earlier, which is how the Egyptians know about them. And in this case, they showed up under Thutmose III. Now, Thutmose III, if you're not familiar with him, is one of the most interesting pharaohs. And I speak about him a great deal in the Joseph lecture. So that's Z04, but he was the Napoleon of pharaohs. He's this great military leader. So in his annals, he lists 
gifts from chiefs in the Greek world. And we can read here, the benevolence of the chief of the Tanaya, so the, in, in other words, what we're saying is the benevolence of the chief of the Denian, silver, a silver gift, a jug of keftu, that's Crete, a, a jug of Crete workmanship along with vessels of iron. Okay, so this shows us that these people have a clear connection to the Greek world. Uh, in fact, they're coming from the Greek world bringing a gift that was manufactured in Crete. That's number one. Now we're going to jump forward almost 100 years later and look at Amenhotep III. Amenhotep III, many Egyptologists consider to be the greatest pharaoh ever, and I've got a lecture about him as well if you want to go to Z05A. But Amenhotep III at his mortuary temple has given us a list of foreign places. They're shown as bound captives. And if you look here, the first name on the right is Keftu, Crete. Right beside it is the Tanaya or the Denyan. Now, that's very interesting that A, when Thutmose III talked about them earlier, he said that the Denyan are bringing this gift for, made in Crete. And now we see the two of them are together right beside each other on this inscription. And there's other places in the Greek world named here too. So this is clearly putting them in the Greek world like Mycenae and Thebes and, and so on and so forth. Now, if you're talking about the Denyan in the Greek world, they also have an etymological match. So the Denyan are equated with the Denoi. Okay, so to the Egyptians, we have the Denyan, which equals the Tanaya. But to the Greeks, this Denyan equals the Denoi. So now we're going to leave Egypt and it's time to head to Greece. Now, who are these Denoi? What do the Greeks tell us about the Denoi? And well, they know exactly where the Denoi come from. Now, first of all, let me just say the Denoi was one of the names used for Greeks by Homer, okay? So Homer gave us this concept of several different ways of referring to the, the, the Greek people. Now, the name the Greeks will tell you, they know where that name came from. It came from King Donos. King Donos, who gives us these, these Greek people, actually was from the Levant. So in the Greek tradition, he came from the Levant. His family had founded Sidon. They had founded Tyre. They had founded Egypt, right? This is, this is his whole family, uh, pretty well established. But he would be known for what he does in Greece, uh, specifically Argos. So. I did the story in detail in Z15A if you want to know more, but I'm going to give you the short version. As I said, King Donos came from the Levant and he was settling into North Africa. His brother, Agaptus, was in Arabia, but his brother decided to make a move to take over more territory, take over more prestigious territory. So Agaptus actually comes to Egypt. Makes sense, right? Because you're thinking Egyptus is not going to be in Arabia. So Egyptus, and who gives us the name Egypt, is now invading on Donos's space, and Egyptus has these 50 sons that are coming with him. Now Donos has 50 daughters, and Egyptus, his brother, wants the 50 sons to marry Donos's 50 daughters. But Donos doesn't want his daughters marrying his brother's sons. So Donos picks up with his daughters, sells across the Mediterranean. Here you go. Sells across the Mediterranean and lands in Greece. So right here in Argos, in, in Greece. Now, uh, I should show, this is the map using Google Maps. I, I think it's helpful to show you what the, this, same Mediterranean area would look like to the ancient Greeks. And if you look at the descriptions based on Herodotus, you will get more of a map like this. So in their mind, King Donos is leaving the Levant, heading here to North Africa and selling across here to Egypt, which gives you a little bit of a better picture for this guy's origins and how he ended up. I actually like the Greek map better than the, the modern map, but things don't go so well for him because his brother is going to come after him. So what do you know? The 50 sons of Agaptus arrive in Argos. But in that time, King Donos has made friends with the Argives, the people of Argos, including their, their king, who was asked to step down from his kingship in order to let King Donos become king of the Argos people. So this is showing now a merger of, the, uh, of Donos and the people from Argos. Now, when Agaptus's 50 sons show up, 
uh, King Donos wants to spare the Argives the battle. So he decides to give in. He's going to give his daughters in to his brother and allow the 50 sons to marry the 50 daughters. But King Donos has a plan. He gives a, he tells each of his daughters to kill their husbands on their wedding night. And so the wedding takes place and that fateful night, the daughters all obey their father's command, except for one. But Hippernestra disobeys her father. Why? Because her new husband, Lynceus, honors her by allowing her to keep her chastity. So by showing her that respect, she cannot go through with killing him and intentionally disobeys her father. Now, eventually those two, Hippernestra and Lynceus, are going to become the the new ruling king and queen of of Argos and their descendants are going to be the line of Argos. So through uh, Hippernestra, uh, King Donos is going, uh, the kings of Argos are going to descend from him. If you want to know more, like I said, check out this Z15A. But I want to talk about this impact of King Donos. Whether you believe it or not, this is what the Greeks believed the impact of King Donos was. So first of all, his descendants would give us the name the Denoi, one of the main top three words used by Homer to describe the Greek people. The Greeks believe that the trade between Egypt and the Greeks started with King Donos, that he, he established this trade. He also taught the Greeks how to dig wells, which interesting, but not so much for our, our lecture, but two more very important points. According to the Greeks, King Donos is what is who brought them modern ship building. That's right, he brought the Pentaconter. Why the Pentaconter? Because you have 50 rowers and King Donos had 50 daughters. So each daughter was one of the rowers and that's where we get our name Pentaconter. But this was considered the, by Greek tradition, the first modern ship. So again, we have this ship connection that keeps coming up tonight. The sea people in their ships, the, the Danites in their ships. And of course, now we have King Donos and his ships, bringing it to the Greeks. And he also was believed to, by some, to have brought the Cadmian writing, which in other words, that's the alphabet. We always hear that the Phoenicians were the ones who brought the alphabet to the Mediterranean. And the Phoenician alphabet to the Greeks, their version of the Phoenician alphabet was the Cadmian alphabet, named after Cadmus. Remember Cadmus, he's gonna come back tonight. So. The majority of tradition says that Cadmus actually brought the alphabet, but there is a minority that, believe, that believes that King Donos brought the alphabet. Uh, either way, it's showing a Greek tradition of the alphabet in the Levant, uh, Phoenician or Hebrew, whatever you want to say, being brought to the Greek world that became the Greek al alphabet, a tradition that is correct whether you believe that these two characters were involved or not. Uh, the Greek alphabet, and as you can see from this chart, was clearly based on from Hebrew and the Phoenicians. I have a great little, and one day I need to spin it off as it's in a little short, but I think it was a lot of fun. I'd, it, during the Abraham lecture, Z03, I went into the development of the first alphabet. And if you haven't seen that, you should check it out. I, I got to, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback about, about that one. Okay, so I'm getting a little bit sidetracked. Summary for our purposes. King Donos started an exchange of people and ideas between Egypt and Greece. He fled North Africa with his alphabet from the Levant and his shipbuilding connects him to the sea. Remember, the Dinian were from the Isles. If Donos was originally linked to the southeastern Mediterranean, it's not surprising his people, the Dinian, would want to return. I just said something very big. More on that later. So let's try to simplify. The Denoi equals the Dinian, right? They're just invaders from Greece with ties to the Levant and they decide to return. Very simple, right? Uh, wrong, because this isn't the end of the lecture. We still have a lot more to talk about. It's time for us to now leave our little stopover in Greece and head to Anatolia and the Levant. If you are not familiar with the Amarna letters, you've got to check out my video Z05A and I give you a good background information on them. 
if you want to know more about this particular letter, and I see it, I didn't put the box here, but I'll talk about it at the end of Z15A. So that's the first of these Denyan lectures. And then I continue that conversation at the very beginning of Z15B. So you can check out those as well. And I explain this in more depth. I map out all these different locations you see on the Amarna letter. It, with this particular letter, what we have is a letter from the King of Tyre that's in modern Lebanon. Uh, and he is writing to the Pharaoh in Egypt. And the sentence I wanna focus on is the one that I have the big red arrow. The king, my Lord wrote to me, write to me what you have heard in Canaan. So the Pharaoh is asking her a report on Canaan. And now he's getting his report. The king of Danuna died. His brother became king after his death and his land is at peace. Now, this is a report on the area of Canaan. This is not Greece. So I can tell you right now, he's not reporting on the king of Argos. He's reporting on a king of the Dununim, of the Danuna who are much closer to him. So let's see where these people are. Here's a map of Anatolia. And again, this is Argos is way over here. Okay, he's not talking about Argos. He's doing a report on Canaan. So he's doing a report on this neighborhood. Okay, so where is this king of the Danuna that the king of Tyre is referring to? Let me zoom in a little bit. And now I want you to see this location. That is Adana. And Adana is named after the Danunim people. And that is going to be our focus next. So let me add one more of my boxes here. So you see this purple box. I'm now going to have a Google map just covering this area. Okay, so our next slide is going to be a Google map covering just this area of the map. Note where Adana is. Note that's where the king of the Danunim people were. This map has been talked about quite a bit in my Z15 lectures. The two best for explaining it, I would say, would be Z15B and, and 15C. So I pointed those out, but it really it's some version of it has come up, I believe, in all the Z15 lectures. Now, the main area of focus for us right now are these X's. So you see these, the red X and the black X and blue X. So these X's all have significant archeological finds to our investigation. So the main one, the most important one, the most famous one is this Karatepe. And I wanna first look at Karatepe. So that's right here, the X on the map. Uh, and let's take a look at what there is to see in Karatepe. So Karatepe was discovered by archeologists in 1946. What it is is a fortress city. It was a fortress city constructed shortly before the Assyrians took over that section of Anatolia. I should mention I'm going to be referring now to that area as Adana or alternatively as Silesia, which are the more common terms you, you would hear uh, archaeologists use to describe that particular, that like southeastern quadrant of Anatolia. Okay, anyway, so we have this bilingual inscription at Karatepe. We have the, the Phoenician alphabet, which is like Hebrew, as I, I said before, but we also have a matching Lubian inscriptions. So whether you, you know the, the Phoenician language or whether you know the Lubian script, either way, you're going to be able to read it. So think about it as like a Rosetta Stone for Lubian, because the Phoenician alphabet was known. And while Lubian was was guessed fairly accurately, this inscription is what brought it all home. This is when they really were able to finally decipher and confirm the guesstimates when it comes to Luvian. But what I want to settle on is the commemoration inscription for the founding of this city. Okay, when the city was, when this fortress city was commemorated, it was done in the name of a king who was listed as a ruler in Adana. Now, let me explain. With the Luvian inscriptions, it's Adana, and that's the name we still see today on the map, Adana. But when you look at the Venetian inscriptions, there is no A, it's just Dana. So the ruler Dana of the Danunim people, right? So this, this should ring a bell now when we think back in our last couple slides ago when we looked at that Armana letter, the king of the Danunim, here's the king of the Danunim. But what's interesting is this inscription was done 500, 600 years after that Armana letter was written. So this is a long period of time. In addition to this 
Donna Danunim connection from this inscription, we also find out that this king is a descendant of the house of Mopsus. And we have a lot coming up on Mopsus. So uh, before I get too far ahead, I want to take a look at a couple more of these inscriptions. So this is kind of a half map of what you saw before. So we're just in Karatepe. But in addition, I want to look at this Senecoy here in Arsuz, in Kreli. What we see over and over again, and these are dated, uh, the ones that I'm showing here are all dated to the 700s, maybe early, maybe late, but believed to be in the 700s. And they all have this Phoenician, they all have the Luvian, the Increly is has uh, Assyrian as well. So we have another language attesting it, but they're all giving us the same message that the king from, see Adana here on the map, the king from this region, right, is the king of Dana, where the Danunin people live, and these kings are descendants from the house of Mopsus. Okay. Now, if you want to know more about these inscriptions, I go through each one of them in depth in Z15b. This lecture doesn't require as much detail as it does for you to get a couple clear points. One is to the Anatolians, the Dinian are then known as the Danunin people. These are the same that the Egyptians called the Dinian, or earlier, a couple hundred years earlier, called the Tanaya. And the Greeks called the Dinian the Denoi. So we have to understand that these people are, it seems that these are all the same people, but they're referred to by different names. Now, some of this can be a little bit confusing. I'm going to answer it later because you're going to say, wait a second, Seth, you told me the Denoi people or the Dinian people seem to come from Greece, from the area of Argos. Now you're telling me they're in Southeast Anatolia. I'm going to explain that, just hang tight. After the Bronze Age collapse, southeastern Anatolia was home to the Danunin people in the land of Adana and ruled by a king from a Greek mythological hero named Mopsus. Okay, so that's, that, that's your, your biggie uh, for this slide. So what's the connection? We have people who etymologically match the Dinian, one of Egypt's sea people. They're at an attested location, as in from the Amarna document, with an Aegean connection right because we just talked about mopsis who comes from the aegean and they're there at the right time in other words circa bronze age collapse and afterwards right you have to get the clue afterwards but there's a problem and what's my problem with these locations with argos and with adana and anatolia well it has to do with islands because if we go back to that ramses the third record from the papyrus Harris that he gave us. He, uh, Ramsey III tells us he slew the, the Danunin, the Dinian, who are in their isles, the Jekker and the Pelis that were made ashes. So in their isles is a problem for us, but maybe it's not because maybe there actually is an island of the Danunin. Okay, so here's our famous map. We just went through these X's. That's what I was just talking about. Now I wanna look at some of these squares. This yellow square, if you look at the center here closely, there is a little island in the middle of that square. This is a very interesting island for our discussion. It's called Donna Island. I wanna take a closer look at Donna Island. Donna Island is the biggest ancient, has the biggest ancient shipyard ever discovered. The shipyard was very recently discovered, uh, just 2016, so five years ago was it discovered, and the research is even after that, uh, certainly something that Dr. Yardin could have never known. Now, it's right off the coast of Turkey, as I just showed you on that map. To give you an idea of the shipyard, there's 270 plus slipways. That means 270 ships could be built and made ready to sell simultaneously simultaneously. So if you have to launch hundreds of ships, let's say across the Mediterranean to invade Egypt, uh, that sounds like a very reasonable place for those ships to have come from, right? Not only that, the dating is perfect because its peak operation was circa 1200 BCE, right when the Sea People's invasions and the Bronze Age collapse was happening. So my point being, any substantial naval operation from Anatolia would involve Donna Island. Now, I want to look at a couple Assyrian inscriptions. All, if you look here in the middle, all kings from the islands amid the sea from the country of Iadana, as far as Farsisi. Now look down here. Ten kings from Cyprus, Iadana, 
is what it actually says, not Cyprus, admits the sea. Now, what's the connection? Like, like I said, the modern island is called Donna Island, but we see in Assyrian descriptions, they're talking about this place in the sea called Iadana. Well, it seems that this E to start off with Donna comes from Isle because the Assyrians who were not sea-based people by any stretch of the imagination actually had no word for isles. And so they probably borrowed the word from Hebrew or the Egyptians, either way, whether they borrow the Hebrew word or the Egyptian word, they're gonna, that for isle, uh, and add that to Donna, they're gonna get this Iadana. So the, the thought is that with the Egyptian, what if you combine Isle and Danunim, you get Iadana. So to what the Phoenicians or the Assyrians would call the Isle of the Danunim, the Egyptians would call the Isle of the Dinian. And suddenly we have a very important explanation for how the Egyptians referred to the Sea Peoples, the Dinian of their Isles, and even better where all these ships came from. Oh, and I'm not done. There's another very important point about these inscriptions. We have another Greek connection because when you look at these Iadana kings, while you would think you would see a bunch of Anatolian names, seven of the ten kings listed have actually been identified as Greek names. So we have Greek names and we have ships. Now I seem to recall, now I seem to recall some other people associated with ships around that time. Can you think of anyone? All right, so in summary, we have the Greek version, the Egyptian version, and the Anatolian version, if you want to say it too, which is the same as the Assyrian version of all these people, right? So the next question is, now we've got to bridge the big gap. How are these people linked to the tribe of Don? And that's where I keep saying we're going to have to come back to the Greeks. We're going to we're going to look at this Greek connection. We're going to look at how these people, supposedly from Greece, came to southeastern Turkey, yet also are connected to these people who we call the Danites of the Israelite tribes. Now, this is the slide you just saw a couple of minutes ago, but now I want to emphasize a new point. So you saw the Greek connection from the Assyrian inscriptions. Now I want to look at the Greek connection from these Luvian inscriptions, and that is the house of Mopsus. So Mopsus is our next connection for explaining the movement of these people. Let's take a closer look. Mopsus became famous when Karatepe was discovered in the 1940s because he became the first Greek mythological hero to be proven by archaeology. So let me explain. When Karatepe was discovered, and we see these kings claiming descent from him, the archaeological world began to think that maybe there's some truth to this guy named Mopsus, who has been found in Greek literature. Now, who was Mopsus? He was a both a ruler and a seer and a riddler during the time of the Trojan War. He was a leader in the worship of Apollo, who's kind of sort of the Greek sun god, you have Helios too, but Apollo is kind of like the, the god of light and sunlight and, and so forth. And Mopsus would go on to be a founder of cities and oracles in Anatolia. He was active circa 1220 to 1170 BCE based on the information that we know. Now, of course, this range I gave you just perfectly hits the range of the Bronze Age collapse, right? Like I, you, you couldn't do any better than that. The point that I want to emphasize, though, is this idea that he was the first Greek mythological hero to be confirmed in reality. Now, he led a migration of Aegean people around the Bronze Age collapse after the Trojan War, at the end of the Trojan War. He's going to lead these people through Anatolia, and here's a map. So we actually have multiple inscriptions mentioning his name from the 10th to the 8th centuries BCE, and Mops's name appears in records of various people in various languages, including the Hittites, the Luvians, and the Greeks from such a huge span of time from the Homeric Greeks all the way to the Byzantine Greeks. And of course, as I've now said a couple times in Cilicia and during the Assyrians reign, uh, both before and after the Assyrians in, in Cilicia. A little bit of background information on Mopsus. He was from 
this era of Anatolia, so if you look mirror on the map, that's basically where he was from. His mother was a prophetess of Apollo, and some say his father was actually the god Apollo, uh, but that would be the minority. The most identify his father as being a, a king from Crete who ended up here in Western Anatolia. And then Mopsus's wife was Pamphile, a princess from Crete. So we've got a double Crete connection, both as his wife and his father. And there is a region here in, 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 in Turkey named, named Pamphylia, who was named, of course, has a uh, etymological connection to Pamphile, Mopsus's wife. Now, I'm not done with Mopsus. Let, let me give you a little bit more information before we move on. So here's just the summary of what was on the other slide. Let's talk about his travels. He starts off in Western Anatolia, and he gets his, his start at the uh, sanctuary of Apollo at Claros. And, you know, I guess he's leading the good life, you know, father's king, mother's a prophet of Apollo. Things are all well and good. And then the Trojan War comes to an end, or is coming to an end, and Calchas, who is the chief seer of the Greek army in the Trojan War, so Calchas shows up in, here in this region, uh, Western Anatolia, uh, where you see Mir on the map, and he hears about this great seer named Mopsus. And of course, Calchas has a pretty good resume himself, chief seer of the Greek army. So he and Mopsus are going to end up getting in a riddler's duel, where they both tell a riddle uh, that one has to explain. It's more a little bit like a riddle slash saying the future. If you want to know the riddle, then go to Z15D. Uh, I'm not going to get into it tonight, but let's say that uh, not only does Calchas, this great seer, lose to Mopsus, that's right, Mopsus won handily, it so crushed Calchas that he actually dies from the defeat. He's so mortified it kills him. So after Calchas is defeated, now all these Greeks are going to join up with Mopsus, and Mopsus is going to lead Calchas' Greeks, along with, I assume, some of his people as well, up through the uh, up through Anatolia to this region we now call Pamphylia, which is named after Mopsus's wife, Pamphile, and then on through the Taurus Mountains. And then he's going to really make a name for himself here in this region of Adana in Cilicia. Now, Mopsus, once he gets to Adana, he founds several cities that are known, the most famous of which is Mopsuestia. So that means the hearth of Mopsus. By the way, remember hearth. Okay, just put it to, just keep it in your head, it's going to come up later. But remember that he named the city Hark of Mopsus. He also named another city Spring of Mopsus, and he founded Malus, which is a oracle site. Now, the archaeology does support an influx of Greeks into this area around 1200 BCE, right? So once again, we have the archaeology matching uh, consistently throughout this entire lecture. Now, the Benunim, then once now, let me just say Adana was there before, right? The Amarna letters were over 100 years before this. So Adana was here before, but this at this moment, it seems that the Danunim really became these native Anatolians that were there before mixed with these Greeks, like perhaps a Greek aristocracy or Greek leadership, but mixed with the with these Greeks. Okay? And Mopsus isn't done yet because there's one other piece to the story I should mention, and that is that it's been told by later Greek tradition that Mopsus led an invasion into Ashkelon. So that's our last arrow right here, right? I'm heading straight down south. Ashkelon's a little bit off the map. We have this tradition that Mopsus led a force originally from Mira to, into Canaan. And why did he invade Ashkelon? Well, to batter, battle the Egyptians. In fact, according to Xanthus, the, our best so Greek source on this little adventure of Mopsus's records his greatest feat being invading Ashkelon with these forces originally from Mira and Mopsus cast the local goddess of Ashkelon into a lake and destroys the temple. He then, this, and then I should say that we have Luvian and Hittite documents that would back up this idea, like the story is told in full by Xanthos, but you can, you can match back with Luvian and Hittite records of the same basic idea. So we have these, these cross references that, that work together. Now, let's summarize what Mopsus means for our discussion. We have a historical figure who's a forefather to the Adana royalty, even though he was once thought to be mythological. He shows us a mixed background of Greek Anatolian and Crete, right, wife and father. He's associated with the Greek god Apollo, Right, who's like the god of light, god, a, a sun god. 
Number four, Mops is, is a seer who liked riddles. He won a riddle contest that would set really his life on its course. He would eventually settle in southeastern Turkey, which is Adana. He led an expedition to Ashkelon and destroyed a temple there. And finally, the rulers of the Duni, the Dununi, or the Dinyan, would later on claim descent from him. So in other words, his memory would, would be maintained by his people. Leg now I want to move away from Mopsis as a man and talk about one of his legacies. Mopsis founded a city called Mopsuestia. This is the one that I told you means the heart of Mopsis. I want to talk about it for a minute. Now, its modern name is Yakanipur. So you're looking at this map saying, where's Mopsuestia? It's right here where you see Yakanipur. That's just the, that's the more modern name. It seems to me, though, when I look this up, it's still even the, known better by another name called uh, Mysis. Okay, so it's, uh, it's a city of, of many names. So in one of my lectures, we took a close look at Mopsuestia, or Mysis, if you prefer, or Yakanipur, if you prefer. Uh, and I want to come back to remind you, or at least review, our discussion we had in that lecture. So this is Z15E. Now, when we visited Mopsuestia, or the, the hearth of Mopsis, we found a fourth century synagogue with quite impressive mosaics. And what stands, what really stands out is you have this full story of Samson in mosaics and it's in terrible condition, okay? But you basically have judges 14 to 16 lined up in detail in nine to 11 scenes, depending on how you count it. And the inscriptions, because there's matching Greek inscriptions here, you can kind of see from these pictures, they come from the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Torah. And they help to identify some of these scenes that are, that are hard to understand. Now, let me just say this top middle one is actually from Chukot in Israel. And I just want to show it because it's quite honestly, it's, it's better than any of the pictures for Mopsuestia. It's just, although they had the remnants of this great Samson mosaic cycle, uh, unfortunately, it's not in that great a shape. So this picture gives you an idea of what it looked like, even though it's not from that, that side as well. Both of these are covered in the Z15E lecture. But I want to talk about Samson at Mopsuestia because it's a little bit weird. Why is it a little bit weird? Let me explain. Samson is emphasized more than any other biblical story at Mopsuestia. Uh, you do have uh, a Noah inscription, but Samson is, is the pride and joy of this, this synagogue. Now, Samson is a very rare motif for a synagogue. Why? Because Samson's a problematic character. He's not a great religious leader. He's not an ideal hero. We'll get more to that in just a minute. There's no other Samson cycle that's so long. I mean, you've got, depending on how you count it, nine or 11 scenes from Samson. Yeah, like even from Kukok, yeah, you have this scene or two from Samson, but it's not like they have full story. You have the full story in order, and the order follows the Hebrew, even though you have Greek inscriptions. In other words, it's written from right to left. The story goes from right to left, even though the Greek is written from left to right. But then, the scenes are clarified by having the Septuagint written in Greek. Very odd. But what I want to focus on is why Samson? Why here? Why would Samson get its greatest focus in of any synagogue in the ancient world? Why would it be here in a town founded by Mopsus? There's a connection. Could it be, we're just thinking out loud here, Samson is from the tribe of Don, is it because the tribe of Don and Mopsus's Dunanim are connected and the people there knew it? Okay, now let's take a look at our Samson story. I did this story in detail on Z15F. I'm not gonna read through the whole story. If you're not familiar with it, just pause the screen and go through this little, this cartoon. It'll give you basically what you need to know. But I'm gonna assume if you're listening beyond this point, you have a decent handle on Samson. So Samson, is from Israelite tribe of Don. He is considered one of the judges, uh, and not judge in a legal sense. In this case, he's more of a warrior. And you recall an angel told his parents to make him a lifelong Nazarite, which has special restrictions, including keeping his hair uncut, through which he would derive super strength. Now, the story gives us 
chronicles many of his failings, which is odd for this, this Jewish leader. He, he went after non-Jewish women, including marrying. He ate non-kosher with non-Jews. He killed 30 Philistines just for their clothes. He killed a lion with his bare hands. He captured 300 foxes and tied a torch to their tails. He made bets on riddles, and that's actually how we ended up killing these people for their clothes. He burned a whole city's crops to get revenge on one person. He killed thousands of Philistines in a personal war, right? His fighting wasn't to fight for the Jewish people. He was fighting a personal vendetta. He also visited a prostitute in Gaza, and he falls for a Philistine woman named Delilah who betrays him by cutting his hair. He finds redemption at the end of the story when Hashem grants him strength one final time to destroy the Philistine temple in Gaza. Okay, so when you read through this, no one is thinking, wow, this is a great Jewish leader, right? What does Samson seem more like, a great Jewish leader or a great Greek hero? And I think all of you would answer B. Now, let's take another look at Mopsus and Samson together. Mopsus and Samson, let's see what they have in common. They're both kind of unusual religious leaders and leaders of multiple tribes. The Danites have a tradition of being composed of multiple people when they brought up the rear. We know Mopsus combined multiple people when he started his migration. They both were warriors fighting for land, right? They were trying to find land for their people or for themselves or a little bit of both. They both were people on the move, right? They were migratory people and they led migratory people. They intermarried with their neighbors. In, in other words, uh, Mopsus brought the people of Crete together, whereas Samson was bringing the Philistines together with the, the Danites, for better or for worse. They both loved riddles. Right? They both were in riddle contests. They both led fighting in Philistia. Remember, Mopsus led the invasion into Ashkelon, and then we had Samson repeatedly fighting in Philistia. They both destroyed a Philistine temple. From addition, Mops destroyed a temple in Ashkelon, where Samson did in, in Gaza. They both are connected to a sun god. Probably didn't think about this before, if you haven't seen my previous lectures, but Mopsus, as we know, was connected to Apollo, whereas Samson is derived from the Hebrew Shemesh, which is sun. So it's very interesting that Samson comes from the word sun, although he tradition does tell us that he was a member of an Israelite tribe, of course, worshiping Hashem, but nonetheless, his name implies some sort of sun connection. And then finally, we have this etymological connection of Mopsus, who led the Danunim or the Danoi, and then you have Samson, who led the, the Danites. Okay, interesting stuff, right? Now, I want to throw one more at you. This was suggested after I did this lecture. The, when I showed the slide at the end of the the Mopsuestia lecture, I had someone mention to me I should talk about Hercules as well. So let's talk about Heracles or Hercules, uh, whichever you want to say. Heracles, by the way, is probably the right way to say it, but everyone says Hercules. So when you compare Samson and Hercules, we have both were super strong, right? They both have the story of slaying this, this great lion as their at their very first deed, right? They both really started their heroic career, so to speak, killing a lion. They both preferred a simple weapon. Samson's most famous was the jawbone of an ass. And then Hercules, like using a club made from a tree, just a simple tree branch basically made into a club. Both at one point in the story were extremely thirsty and drank water from a rock. Both tore down city gates. I'm gonna assume you know the Hercules story enough. I, I don't think we need to spend too much time on this, but I think it's interesting. It's enough fun to, to go through, but not spend a lot of time on. Both were betrayed by a woman they loved, which really led to their downfall. And in the end, they both actually killed themselves, which reminds me, you know, killing oneself is a very odd ending for a Jewish hero, another oddity, right? Now, I can't connect much of Samson, although you do have the story of David and Eliam, but you can't connect much of the Samson story with other characters in Jewish tradition. However, Samson does match very well with other characters of Greek mythology beyond just Mopsus and beyond just Heracles, right? We have Nisus, whose power was, was derived from his hair, and his daughter, in this case, his daughter cut his hair, a woman again being his downfall. We have Aristius and the bees coming out of a carcass. It's, uh, it was, a most people say, a cattle carcass, although I did see Graves made the argument that it was a lion as well. Another point, in a lot of Greek mythology, you have this concept of the moon versus the sun, and 
it's worth taking a mention that Delilah actually is derived from the name Lila. Now, Lila is night. So if Samson is the sun and Delilah is night, you again have this, this night versus day, this moon versus sun type concept, which reoccurs in Greek mythology, but not in Jewish tradition. Long hair is typical of sun heroes. So we have this, this idea also of the uh, Greek mythology that if you're a sun hero, you have long hair. Why? Because symbolically, the, the long hair is like rays of the sun. Uh, I would assume in most cases you picture a blonde, kind of fits better, but not necessarily. And so the long hair is like your rays of the sun, which, which again connects back to Samson's Hebrew name being Shimshon, which is connected with Shemesh, the, the sun. And then finally, your riddles, but you have them over and over and over again reoccurring in Greek mythology. All this gives Samson this, this Greek connection. So we have this Mopsuestia that clearly the Jews identified with Samson much more than any other ancient synagogue identified with Samson. And where is it? It's in the city of Mopsus. And look at all the connections you have between Samson and Mopsus. And Samson seemed more like a Greek hero. And it, particularly his ties to Heracles and Mopsus. In fact, if you were to mix Mopsus and Heracles into a pot, you may just get Samson. Oh, and speaking of pots, I think it's time to get back to our archaeology. So let's do, take a couple more archaeological stops. So here's our map again. It's our famous map we keep showing of the migration and then the the different sea peoples settling on the, along the coast of Canaan. So I want to point out again Jaffa and then Don. So Jaffa and Don. I want to look at the archaeology of these two cities to see if they can tell us anything that will help in our investigation. This map here gives you three different sites. So we we're just up here in Anatolia, right? So this is the area of Adana. But what I really want to do is focus on these two sites in modern Israel. One is Tel Kassile, which you see is right beside Jaffa. So that's this dot here is Tel Kassile. So Tel Kassile and Jaffa. Okay, now Tel Kassile is actually in a park in Tel Aviv, okay? And then we're gonna, after that, we're gonna look at Tel Don uh, up here in Northern Israel. But let's start off with Tel Kassile, because A, we, as we see from judges, the Jewish tradition tells us that the tribe of Don started up here around Jaffa. So let's go see Tel Kassile, which is right beside Jaffa. Now, Tel Kassile, I give you the full story and we really look at the maps and the development and, and a lot of the archeological finds. If you look at my last lecture, which was Z15G, we go through it in detail. You're only gonna get the highlights tonight. Now, Tel Kassile, as I said, is within the city limits of Tel Aviv. It's actually like an inner harbor for the Mediterranean. So you've got this Yarkon River coming in through Tel Aviv meeting the Mediterranean and Tel Kassile was intentionally built as a port just a little bit off the Mediterranean. Now the port was founded on virgin soil around 1200 BCE as dated by archaeologists. So we're once again coming back to our date of 1200 BCE. It keeps recurring over and over again. Now, it was clearly a Philistine city, more on that in just a second, it was clearly a Philistine city from around 1200 to 1000 BCE, okay? It would then be annexed by the Kingdom of Israel, either under David or Solomon, depending on whose version you hear, but during the United Monarchy, it would become part of the, the Kingdom of Israel. Now, Tel Kassile in archaeology, the, there is a temple area with a residential quarter that has gotten the most attention. And this is a reconstruction of that temple right there. Now, this temple was had three levels of occupation. It was, in other words, it was rebuilt three times. And so this is the first one. This is the smallest version uh, of that temple. And I talk about this in detail in that Z15G. Now, when I say Philistine, you see I keep putting it in quotes. That's because what could be labeled as Philistine really should be looked at as sea people in general. And if you want to go back and look at my lectures like the Z13 lecture or, or this last one, Z15G, talk about some in Z14. So point being, what we say Philistine comes from the biblical tradition, but you have to see from an archaeological point of view, Philistine actually can mean different sea peoples. So it seems in this first level that when this port was founded around 1200 BCE, we have this um, a different Philistine, a different sea people than those that would occupy the next two levels. So in other words, they 
after this first level with the smallest version of the temple was destroyed, another Philistine-like people, but different, uh, destroyed the city and rebuilt it. So if they were all friends and all the same people, they're not going to come and destroy their own city, right? So the indication would be that whoever was there, they were close, culturally speaking, but they weren't the same, and they destroyed their neighbors and then moved in. Now, this temple is a huge, huge deal when it was discovered because it was the first Philistine slash AGN temple ever to be excavated, like major, major deal. Uh, and remember, we can't go to Gaza anymore to excavate Gaza completely. I don't mean that from a political point. Well, that's an issue too right now, but uh, I just mean the city is completely overbuilt on and overbuilt on, so you can't go excavating there. So to find this temple at Tel Kasile was a huge, huge deal. Um, and then also, in addition to the temple, there was also an administrative complex with the hearth. And I told you when I first mentioned Mops to Estia, remember this hearth concept? Well, I'm coming back to it now because the hearth is an indication of a non-Canaanite population, more specifically in our case, one of the Sea Peoples, right? Because the hearth is a central element to construction in the Greek world that was completely non-existent to native Canaanites. And I mean that both, but uh, people from Greek, the Greek world certainly did. And this map kind of gives you an idea of where they have found these hearths from the Philistine world. Now, what does this all mean? So I'm gonna get back to Yadin's theory, okay? So what Yadin's theory is telling us about Tel Kassile is as follows. We have sea peoples who moved in, but as I said, they were not the Philistines proper. They're generically labeled Philistines, but they were another sea peoples that came in. They built a new port where there was no port before. Now, if they were the same sea peoples to the south in Philistia, well, they have Ashkelon, so the Philistines in the south didn't need a new port. And if they were the north, like Jekyll, well, they have Dor. They don't need a new port either. But if they were a different people moving in, they do need a port for them. And if they're people that have ships, they definitely have to have a port. They can't be borrowing someone else's port. They need a port on their territory. So we conveniently have this new port built in between, which would be an indication that this is a different people than the other Philistines. Now, this first layer of occupation was short, probably only about 50 years, give or take a decade or so. Then we have another group of sea peoples or Philistines, really Philistines proper, move in to replace these sea peoples that were there before. This freestanding hearth though does give us a clear connection to the Aegean world, even at this, this first layer. And this Philistine temple is of note, not just because it's the only one that excavated, because it gives us an idea of what a Philistine temple really looked like and what, we, what was in it and how it was set up. So in summary, we have this brief settlement of Philistine-like people, but they weren't Philistines, they were different. They're like a group of sea people who picked up and left. Okay, now I told you we we're going to talk about two sites, Tel Kassile and Tel Don. It's now for time to talk about Tel Don. So remember, Tel Don was an ancient city even before the Danites arrived. So it was Laish, and its settlement goes back really to, to the, the dawn of civilization. Uh, and I'll, I talk about its origins as well. You get a lot more about Don. Don is actually amazing in archaeology. So if you're not familiar with it, please check out my last lecture, Z15G. But for our story tonight, I'm only going to give you the basics. Now, the the main stratums worried about are stratums seven, six, and five. So seven being the oldest, this was late Bronze Age, and there was a destruction layer after seven. And then six starts, and this is when it's proposed that the Danites moved in. It's been dated roughly to around 1150 to 1100 BCE. So if Tel Kassile started being found at circa 1200 and the people were there for 50 years and then moved, then this 1150 date kind of sounds good and it matches with our Bronze Age collapse around uh, 1190 to 1177 BC and it matches with our exodus with the Jews coming in after 1210 BC and then settling a few decades later, it all kind of works together with our dating, right? It all, all kind of comes together. Now, what's interesting about this layer is if you looked at layer seven, this late Bronze Age layer, it's a very sophisticated, advanced culture with a lot of trade goods, valuable goods in the area. But when you look at stratum six, it was replaced by a lower level of civilization. It was replaced by people who lived in tents and built storage pits for their grain, which is a clear downgrade from the previous stratum. Now, when you look at the pottery, and I looked a lot more pottery in the last lecture, but I wanna hit a couple highlights. So the, the 
valuable pottery disappeared when he went from stratum seven to six. And much, but not all of the uh, pottery from the Aegean world disappeared as well. It certainly, some of it, it was still there, but it seemed to change. And Sidonian was, was also greatly decreased, which is relevant to our earlier discussion about the Sidonians once protecting Laish, but no longer able to do so once Laish became Teldon. Now, the greatest amount of research on any specific item has been on these cholera and pithoi. These cholera and pithoi are considered a sign of Israelite occupation by archaeologists. And so while we have a mix of the other pottery, the other ware that was discovered, when you look specifically at the pithoi, it shows this Israelite, this very specific Israelite item. So it seems when you step back and look at it, that you have a culture that still has some Greek traditions, but seems to be now transitioning. This is like a transition point for to this some Israelite traits. And it's from a transitory people because these are these first layers characterize people by people living in tents, right? There was also an Aegean temple that was discovered, not as impressive as what we saw at Tel Kassile, but still the only location this Aegean temple can really be compared to is the Tel Kassile one. So Tel Don and Tel Kassile have a lot in common. The pottery too. Now a lot of the items from the pottery have been found in other sites like Megiddo and Khazor and all that, but when you look at the entire body of what's been found, Tel Kassile's finds are, are arguably the most comparable. Now, let me get back to this point. I know I keep saying it, but it's important. Let's get back to this tent concept, okay? I'm emphasizing, would the same people who lived through the urban success and civilization of the late Bronze Age, when this was like an international trading city with, I, with wealthy, valuable items from all over the world, would they revert to living in tents with storage pits afterwards? And that's unlikely, right? Like pretty much everyone's gonna agree that this was a different people who moved in, people that were not, used to the same level of civilization, people who lived in tents, people who lived in camps. And when you look back at our Judges 13 and Judges 18, we know a people who supposedly moved to Tel Don who liked to live in camps and had tents. And we have the scripture now matching the archeology. span So let's get back to how Tel Don helps us with Yadin's theory as well. It's close in timing to Tel Kassile. You have a distinct change of civilization this stratum six, when it was first, when you first had this change of civilization, was clearly settled by semi-nomadic people. You have Israelite pottery that appears at this layer, but also you have others from the Aegean. Okay, so it's not exactly clear cut, but you seem to see this this transition happening. And then you have this distinct Aegean temple, which the most comparable ever discovered in Israel is in Tel Kassile, which is obviously quite convenient. In summary. Around in the 1100s BCE, when Stratum 6 was founded, it was settled by migratory people with a transitional culture, a culture blending Israelite and the Aegean. And speaking of the Aegean, I want to hop back over to the Aegean world to show you something else. And this is a slide y'all haven't seen before. Now, I want to talk about Hecateus and what the Greek tradition actually tells us about the Jewish exodus. I know that sounds a little bit odd, but uh, this is what the Greeks say about the Jews, the ancient Greeks said about the Jews. And I want to talk about Hecateus of Abdera. There's a couple different Hecateuses, and I have this down below, but I'm going to say it now. This is not the Hecateus of Miletus. So if you've studied Herodotus, you're going to hear Hecateus, and you're going to think that's what I'm talking about. I'm actually talking about a later one. So if Hecateus of Miletus was the number one Hecateus, this is number two Hecateus, and he came around a couple hundred years later. Now, uh, this Hecateus, though, was also a Greek historian. He was a philosopher. He lived in the 300s BCE. He was from Abdera, which is a, a Greek city on the Thracian coast. Now, no, of, no works of his survive, uh, unfortunately. We only have fragments from other authors, but we have cases like, say, Diodorus Siculus, who gave us a large summary of what Hecateus wrote and credited as Hecateus's writing. Now, one other point about Hecateus, before I move on, in fact, I almost forgot, but I wanted to mention that 
Ecataeus is credited by some with being the one who told Ptolemy II to have the Septuagint created. Now, the Septuagint, in order for it to be created, Ptolemy II had to get together 72 uh, Jewish scholars who spoke both Hebrew and Greek in order to write it. And, and I go through it in more detail if you go to the lecture on Samson's synagogue. I talk about it in there. But just to connect with that lecture, I should point out that there's many that think that Hecateus was the guy who gave Ptolemy II the, the idea to have Sep the Septuagint written. Okay, anyway, that's enough on that aside. Let, let's get into the writing of Hecateus. If you look at this big, long, wordy section, and I'm obviously not going to read this to you, but feel free to pause the screen and check it out. It's very interesting to read, but this is what Hecateus of Abdera said in 300 BCE, what he wrote in 300 BCE regarding the Jews. It's then quoted or summarized by Diodorus Siculus. Siculus just means of Sicily, so Di Diodorus of Sicily. It's just a summary of what Diodorus said that Hecateus said. Uh, anyway, pause the screen and read it if you're interesting. I think it's very interesting, but I'm just going to point out, I don't know, three or four sentences here that I want to highlight. So you can see these sentences in this text here, but let, let's just do this as a short version. In ancient times, a great plague occurred, occurred in Egypt. Remember, this is what Hecate has said about the Jews. In ancient times, a great plague occurred in Egypt, and many ascribed the cause of it to the gods who were offended by them. Therefore, the native inhabitants concluded that unless all the foreigners were driven out, they would never be free from these plague miseries, and all the foreigners were forthwith expelled. Okay, so this is the exodus, right? So the native Egyptians have concluded that their plague's not going to be able to like, get rid of the, these foreigners. Uh, these foreigners were, or, or include the Jews. Okay, now number three, the majority of these expelled people descended into a country not far from Egypt, which is called Judea. Okay, makes sense, sounds good. The leader of this colony was one Moses, a very wise and valiant man. Okay, great, and you can read on here and see what else he says about Moses, but I wanna focus on just one more sentence, and that is, Hecateus also tells us the most valiant and noble among the expelled people under some notable leaders were brought to Greece in other places, as some relate, the most famous of these leaders of the expelled people who came to Greece were Donos and Cadmus. Remember Donos, our King Donos, who founded the Denoi, and Cadmus, who brought us the Cadmian alphabet. It's amazing the two of them now are coming back up, right? So, what is Hecateus telling us about the Exodus in brief? Well, first of all, it's mostly in line with what Jewish tradition tells us, right? So the Exodus was from Egypt, the Egyptians suffered plagues there, and the Jews were forced out or picked up and left and moved into Israel. But what, what's interesting is this additional line that Hecateus tells us the most valiant and noble, though, didn't go to Israel, they actually went to Greece. And this, these are the, this is King Donos and Cadmus and their descendants, which goes great with our initial Greek mythological discussion of King Donos, Egypt and then founding his people in Argos. So to summarize what we've just learned, the classical Greek view would be as follows. At Exodus, Donos led Semites from Egypt to Greece, who then mixed with the Argives, the people of Argos, and they, they became the Denoi, okay? To the Egyptians, the Denian of the sea were the Denoi, and to the Anatolians, the Denunim of Adana can be equated with the Denoi. So, it's all coming together now. The tribe of Don, they were the same people as the Nunoi, they were the same people as the Dinyan, who were the same people as the Dununim. The sea people known as the Dinyan were the tribe of Don coming back home. All right, so let's summarize. I covered a lot uh, tonight, but we're, we're now at the end. So the Bronze Age collapse was a few decades after the Exodus, about when the Israelites started permanent settlements in Canaan, okay? Makes sense. Egypt was invaded by militaristic seagoing peoples with ships. Remember how important ships have been tonight. And at least three peoples migrated with families into Canaan. So this is when I'm talking about the Jekyll and the Chardon and the Philistines, but we know there was at least a fourth, right? The Dinian. The four people connected by the, so I should say, speaking of the Dinian, and we're going to see that the Dinian Sea people can be seen as being four different people. What these four different peoples have in common is this DN in their name, or this DNN, depending on who's, who's 
writing it, but they all have this DN and then they all have a special association with ships. And they're all of course from the Mediterranean, which is more general, but this DN and the ships are, are key. They're also never listed simultaneously in the same records. And, and maybe I should have said this earlier, but this is an important point. What I'm saying is the Greeks never say the Denoi and the Dinian are there at the same time. The, the Egyptians never say the Dinian and the uh, Tanaya are there at the same time. They never say the Dinian and the Denoi at the same time same time. They know who the Danunim are, but they never mention the Danunim together with the Dinian. In other words, these people are all mutually exclusive. You only have one of them in any given place, which then makes you think that, oh, they could all really be the same people. If they were both mentioned in the same place at the same time, it would make it much less likely they're the same, that they could all be the same people. Now, the Danoi that the Greeks gave us, they tell us that they were people who left Egypt to create a community in Greece, a merged Semitic Greek people led by King Donos, who some say brought shipbuilding and the alphabet from the Levant to the Greek people. Number two, we have the Denian, one of Egypt's sea peoples with ties to the Philistines. Okay, so remember that they were one of the three people that were all together with the Philistines, but they disappeared from Egyptian records after Ramses III. Wait, so we saw that some of the other people they still talked about, right? Like the Jekyll and the Philistines were still talked about in the Egyptian records, but the Dinian just disappeared. Like they just ceased to exist or they became someone else. Finally, we have the Danunim. The Danunim were people in Adana or Cilicia, if you prefer, and they were famous in antiquity for hundreds of years for their ships and for their shipyard, particularly on Donna Island. And they were led by a Greek hero named Mopsus, who can easily be compared to Samson. Speaking of Samson, our number four people here, of course, is the tribe of Don, who were Israelites. They were known for being in their ships, which is very unique for people who left Egypt on foot. Other tribes are told to treat Don as a tribe, as though they weren't originally a tribe or they weren't for some time a tribe. The tribe needed a priest because they didn't know their own religion, another odd detail. But we do know the tribe of Don by all sources, they were a migratory people who lived in camps and everything works that we saw for that. Then you have Samson, who's like a Greek hero, right? He's, he's as I said, if you mix Mopsus and Hercules in a pot, but what Samson doesn't seem like is a Jewish leader. You would think he shows perhaps some Greek traditions, some Greek influence on an Israelite tribe. Now, the tribe of Don lost or never had an inheritance, uh, depending on whether you're reading Joshua or Judges, and then they ended up moving north. So they started off at a hole in the map. So remember, I was plotted the sea people on the map, and I said there's this one place that wasn't taken, and what do you know? That's where the tribe of Don was from, uh, near modern Tel Aviv. This is the same place listed as Don's inheritance in both Joshua and his Samson story, right? So Samson's also operating in this area. We're told he begins life operating out of a camp, in, in this area. Now, the archeology span at Tel Kassile shows that we have a short-term stay for people with Aegean ties. So we had one Aegean people that stayed around for a few decades and replaced by the Philistines. This would then match that Samson had repeated conflicts in the area from Joppa to Gaza as he's fighting with the Philistines, uh, trying to uh, really establish himself, but it's during a time that his people are trying to be established. And then we have the archaeology at Tel Don, which shows that we had a mig migratory people with a mixed Aegean and Israelite culture move in, who, by the way, were people who lived in camps. Okay, so let's, let's summarize Yadin's conclusion. The tribe of Don was one of the Sea Peoples, but one with Semitic ties. Their exodus took them from Egypt to Greece, but they would return to Canaan during the collapse. The Danites settled around Joppa for some time as they integrated into Israelite culture. When Philistines forced them out of the Joppa area, they were accepted enough by Israelites to move to the area of Tel Don in the north and to settle permanently where they would become readmitted to the family, so to speak. And with that, I'll end with, what do you think? I've given you a lot to think about. Take a minute to think about. Think about how many hours of lectures that we went through to put together to this moment. And I hope you get a kick out of it as being an appropriate finale to our months long Bronze Age Collapse series. Hope you enjoyed the lecture. Uh, if you did, please like the video. It, it, does help, it does help me a lot when everyone likes the video and also subscribe to the channel. The most help you can be for me is to 
share with your friends. And I look forward to seeing you again in the very near future as we'll be starting a new series very soon. Thanks and have a great evening.